Okay, good deal. So we're going to do anatomy of the heart for just a minute and talk about circulation into and out of the heart for a few moments. The heart has a broad section which is called the base which actually faces upward and then the apex which is the pointy part actually faces down to the left so when we look at a pyramid we would we would call the bottom of the pyramid the base and the top the apex so it's a little bit there's a surprise inside okay so when we look at the heart there are incoming vessels inferior vena cava and superior vena cava which bring blood to the right atrium and let's look inside of the right atrium maybe something in this that we could imagine inside of this atrium would be the pacemaker so the pacemaker is what sets the inherent contractile rhythm of the heart it causes the top part of the heart to depolarize in the P wave. And then there is a little bit of a delay from the top part of the heart at the inner, between the atria and the ventricles, there is an AV node. And you can actually see a little bit of a, a, a branch right here. There is an AV bundle, a branch, and then there are Purkinje fibers that innervate the bottom of the heart. And so the atria have to contract from the top down to completely empty blood into the ventricles. And then the ventricles have to contract from the bottom up so that blood can be forced through the uh, pulmonary trunk and through the aortic semilunar valve that you can see in this picture. So I didn't actually intend to talk about conduction of a electrical conduction, but we did that anyway. Remember that the depolarization of the atria is the P wave. The QRS complex is the depolarization of the ventricles. And then the T wave at the very end of a heartbeat is repolarization of the ventricles. And we learned too that the repolarization of the atria is hidden within the QRS complex. So let's continue on with the heart and how it, how it acts, how it functions. Blood is forced from the atria into the ventricles through uh, valves, atrioventricular valves. On the left, um, excuse me, on the right, this is the right. Remember, you're looking at your patient, so what's on the left to you is my right. Your left, my right. <clears throat> As blood goes from the, the atrium, the right atrium, it goes into the right ventricle. And notice that there are these little cords, they look like parachute strings to me, and they're attached to little muscles called papillary muscles. This prohibits this valve from prolapsing backward, so that when the blood is forced through and then the blood pressure inside of that ventricle gets high, it actually slaps that ventricle um, that valve shut. And so when both of the valves, the AV valves slam shut, that is actually the first heart sound. Uh, your book calls it lubbed up. It always sounds like to me like dump, 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 something more like that as compared to lubbed up. But anyhow, however you want to call it, the first sound is the simultaneous closing of the atrial ventricular valves, the tricuspid on the right, the bicuspid on the left. Then what happens is blood leaves the ventricles and as the blood goes into the pulmonary trunk from the right ventricle, the aorta from the left ventricle, pressure builds up in these vessels and as it tries to push back down into the heart, there are one way valves here that also close in the same manner that I showed you just a minute ago to create the second heart sound. So let's go back and kind of review. Inferior vena cava and superior vena cava bring blood to the right atrium. And from the right atrium, blood goes to the right ventricle through the tricuspid valve. 
The tricuspid valve is prohibited in prolapse by the chordae tendinae, which are attached to the papillary muscles. This irregular looking tissue inside of the heart is called the trabeculae carnae. Blood goes from the right ventricle through this tooth looking cusp right here to the pulmonary trunk. This is the pulmonary semilunar valve. The blood goes to the lungs and we would call these the pulmonary arteries. It's a little bit deceptive because they're blue. It's a situation in your body where you have deoxygenated blood moving through an artery. After the blood is oxygenated, it comes back to the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. Here's another one of those exceptions to the rule. Good test question because these carry oxygenated blood, even though they're called veins. The blood goes back into the left atrium and goes from the left atrium through the, through the left to the left ventricle through the bicuspid or mitral valve. This is the more common one affected in people that have heart problems. A lot of people live their lives with bicuspid defects. Somebody might would ask what causes a, a valve issue? I, I think that if someone had an infection that lodged into the valve and endocarditis could cause it, probably prolonged high blood pressure could, could damage these valves as well. There are probably other causes. When the blood goes from the left atrium to the left ventricle, this valve will then close because it's a one-way valve. And as the pressure builds in the ventricle, it will force open the aortic semilunar valve. And then when the pressure in the aorta starts getting higher or equal to the pressure in the ventricle, it's gonna slam that valve shut. Remember when the semilunar valves slam shut, that's the second heart sound. Of the, dove. the blood, as it leaves the heart, will go through the aortic arch. And if you look at the outside, you can see that there are coronary arteries that, that supply the heart muscle itself. And once the heart is served, then the, the venous the deoxygenated blood will then drain back into the sinus venosus and then back into the right atrium. So the heart does work, but it has to, it has to have help as well, oxygenated blood. When those coronary arteries get blocked, that can be a problem. That can be a myocardial infarction, a heart attack. And while we're on that topic just for a second, sometimes, for instance, if there was a blockage in this anterior descending artery, then they might take a great saphenous vein from your leg and connect this artery past the point of the blockage over here so that you're, this is called what? It's called a bypass surgery, right? So if it's a triple, quadruple, then that you're assuming you're getting lots of little extra pipes put on your, on your heart. Now they have the ability to put stents in a lot of these blocked arteries and not do some of that and not have to crack people open and do a chest surgery like they used to. That's marvelous technology. It's beautiful. Notice as we look at the outside of the heart too, that the left atrium and the right atrium, they kind of look kind of like a kind of a yucky looking ear. And so because of that, they, they are sometimes called auricles. Remember too that the heart itself has a layer on the outside of it called the visceral pericardium. There's also a, a fibrous pericardium around the outer the parietal pericardium that's made of a fibrous layer and a serous layer. There's a little tiny space between the the parietal pericardium and the visceral pericardium so that the heart beats lubricated in a, in a sack, basically. Can't be too much liquid. That would be cardiac tamponade when the heart is beating in a lot of liquid. That's not healthy. <clears throat> 80 beats per minute is about what you get, usually. 
maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less. More is called tachycardia, less is called bradycardia. Another interesting note before I get back to the vessels that come off of the aorta is that there is a ductus arteriosus that then withers into a ligamentum arteriosus. We learned also that during the fetal time, that's probably what this little oval area is representing here. During the fetal time, there's mixture of the right atrium with the left atrium blood, and there's also a connection from the pulmonary trunk directly into the systemic circuit. Why? Because in the baby is not breathing air. The baby's in a water environment, and so there's really no need to send blood to the lungs because the lungs can't really do anything at that time. So that allows the, the baby's oxygenated blood that comes from the mother through the umbilicus to route directly from the right ventricle, in effect, pulmonary trunk, into the systemic circulation. So after the baby is born, the, the connection between the pulmonary trunk and the aortic arch withers away, and also the foraminal valley closes. Sometimes the foraminal valley doesn't close, and that might be a little baby, a little child that has purple fingertips, purple lips, purple tip of the nose. I've seen that before in little people that have heart defects. Foraminal valley, patent foraminal valley, from what I understand, is one of the most common congenital heart defects. So it afflicts a number of children. Let's talk about the circulation, uh, the arterial circulation after it leaves the heart. The first major branch is the brachiocephalic trunk. It will give rise to the right subclavian and to the right common carotid. The right common carotid will then bifurcate into the internal carotid and the external carotid. And we learned just a few minutes ago that the internal carotid is one of the prime blood supplies to the brain. We see it in the circle of Willis. It's the one that continues as the middle cerebral artery. Interestingly enough, in the arterial system, the second branch is not the left brachiocephalic trunk. It is actually the left common carotid and then the left subclavian. Now, remember that when the venous supply comes back to the heart, there is a right and a left brachiocephalic trunk in the venous system, but not so in the arterial system. That seems to be one of the things that we get attracted to are the exceptions to the rule. As the aorta plunges down through the chest, it's called the thoracic aorta, it then plunges down into the abdomen and we see the celiac trunk, superior, inferior mesenteric arteries, we see the renal, renal arteries going to the kidneys, down in the lower part of the pelvic cavity, we have the split of the aorta going into the right and left common iliac, external iliac, and then the femoral artery down the leg. Then it continues behind the knee in the popliteal artery, and then in the front, uh, anterior tibial, posterior tibial, out back, and then the dorsal pedis is the continuation of the anterior tibial. This will be a pulse on the top of the foot. Now, when we go down the arm, we have right and left subclavians, but then it goes into the axillary artery. Axillary literally means armpit, and then it goes into the brachial artery, and then from the brachial, it splits into the ulnar and the radial arteries. Remember that the radial is the one that we trap, to, trap against the radial bone to get a pulse.